Up next on Boston Public Radio, Deval Patrick joins us for an hour. He'll take our questions and yours via email and on the phone. And then Christopher Lydon takes on the issue of Barack Obama and drones. Following that, a Republican candidate for the U.S. Senate. That's Michael Sullivan. He'll stop on by. And finally, a priest from Argentina shares tales of his interactions with a man who just yesterday became Pope Francis. That's all right ahead on Boston Public Radio. From NPR News in Washington, I'm Barbara Klein. Some positive signs on the nation's economy today. First-time jobless claims fell last week for the third consecutive week. The foreclosure listing from Realty Track says actual home repossessions from foreclosure are at their lowest level since 2007. And while wholesale prices rose last month, it was the smallest increase in two years and mostly blamed on higher gas prices. Pope Francis delivers his inaugural Mass to Cardinals in the Sistine Chapel this hour. Earlier today, he slipped out of the Vatican, went to collect his luggage and pay his bill at the residence where he'd been staying. And as NPR Silvia Pajoli reports from Rome, he visited the Roman Basilica dedicated to Mary. Pope Francis visited Rome's Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore, the world's oldest church dedicated to Mary. A priest who prayed with the Pope said they'd been given only 10 minutes advance notice that the Pope was coming. Pope Francis is a man of many firsts, the first Pope to use that name, the first non-European Pope since the Middle Ages, and the first Latin American Pope ever. He described himself as coming from the ends of the world. One of his first acts was to speak on the phone with his predecessor, and he will visit Benedict, the Pope Emeritus, at the papal summer residence at Castel Gandolfo. Silvio Poggioli, NPR News, Rome. Most drivers in the U.S. talk on their cell phones while behind the wheel, and about a third text or email. That's according to new federal data. NPR's Rob Stein has details. The Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention analyzed data from two big surveys and found that 69% of Americans reported talking on their cell phones while driving at least once in the previous month. That's a lot higher than drivers in Europe. Only 21% of British drivers reported chatting on their cell phones while behind the wheel, for example. In Germany and France, it was only about 40%. Same goes for reading or sending text or emails. About a third of every U.S. driver said they did that, and that's about double what it was in Spain and Britain. Health officials say that's a big problem because driving while distracted can cause fatal car accidents. Rob Stein, NPR News. A Senate committee this morning approved an assault weapons ban. It was a party-line vote and it isn't expected to win passage in the full Senate. Police in upstate New York say a gunman suspected of a deadly shooting spree yesterday has been killed. They say teams surrounded a building where 64-year-old Kurt Myers was holed up overnight and stormed in this morning. When the entry team was coming through, he first engaged firing shots through the door at the officers and then ultimately exchanged shots with the officers. That's Superintendent Joseph D'Amico. Police say Meyer shot and killed a police dog this morning. He's suspected of a shooting spree yesterday in two communities that left four people dead and two injured. On Wall Street at this hour, the Dow is up 59, the Nasdaq up 10. This is NPR. Good afternoon from the WGBH Radio Newsroom in Boston. I'm Christina Quinn with the local stories we're following. A federal appeals court has agreed to a defense request to remove the judge assigned to the upcoming trial of accused gangster Whitey Bulger. The defense wanted Judge Richard Stearns off the case because he was a federal prosecutor in Boston while Bulger was working as an FBI informant. The Boston School Committee voted late last night to adopt a new assignment plan that will provide families with more options to attend schools closer to home. This replaces a court-ordered desegregation assignment plan put in place 25 years ago. Boston School Committee spokesman Lee McGuire says this new plan will reduce the distance students will have to travel to school by 40% and will increase the chances of a family getting the school they requested. 
these are things that families have been asking for for a very long time in the city of Boston. Um, but they've also been asking for quality and fairness, and we think this plan helps deliver all of those things at the same time. But Boston City Councilor and mayoral candidate John Connolly says this new plan is more confusing than the prior one and that eliminating the walk zone preference will take priority away from students who live within walking distance of a better performing school. It is just fundamentally replacing one convoluted system with another convoluted system and not getting to the real heart of the issue, which is getting every child a quality school and giving access uh, and guarantees on seats, whether they're close to home or not. And the plan doesn't deliver that. We'll have more on Boston's new school assignment plan throughout the afternoon. A new report shows Rhode Island's foreclosure rate fell dramatically last year. Housing Works RI says more than 1,600 residential foreclosure deeds were filed last year, down 23% from a year earlier and down 43% since 2009. Support for NPR comes from Harriet and Richard Gold to help extend the breadth and depth of NPR news programming and coverage of global events. It's 35 degrees right now outside of our Brighton studios, and we can expect the temperatures to climb into the lower 40s today. It'll be uh, cloudy throughout the afternoon. Tonight, cloudy skies, cooler with lows in the lower 20s. At 1206, 30 degrees in Boston, Worcester, and 34 in Providence. Eastern Brady, I am Marjorie Egan. You are listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 WGBH. And there are not just two of us today. We're joined by a third, which brings back memories, I should say, of days <laughs> gone by. We are joined by the governor of the Commonwealth for an hour of Ask the Governor. That's him From singing. The but go take of my mind. I know Barack oh Obama. God. I've heard Barack Obama oh sing. God. You are no, but that was actually that was quite pretty something. impressive. Who, who, what are you talking about? Your song. <laughs> that wasn't me. Oh, okay. yeah. Yes, it was, Governor. How have you been? We really I've appreciate been great. Joining Congratulations us. on your thank new you. show. Thank it's you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. You very, both very sound much. different on public radio. I know. I think we do. I, I've cleaned up my act somewhat. You know, I have not yet. Well, I intend to, to at some seen. point. There. But try thank you, behave. Governor. And by the way, we will. The governor will take your calls for this full hour. And our number is eight seven seven three zero one eighty nine seventy. You can tweet questions at BOS Boss Public Radio. You can email us at bpr at wgbh dot org, and you can leave a question on our Facebook page at Boston Public Radio. And if we can do this as we have in the past, if we don't get to calls or to emails or to other messages through other um, means, we will collect those, um, take them back to the office and get people uh, responses. We will make sure you get them all. Again, the number is 877 if you want to talk directly to the governor, 301-8970. So I just wonder, uh, Governor, it is Thursday, of course. That means it's three days and counting to the big St. Patrick's Day breakfast. <laughs> And I wonder if you're all ready to go. You get your outfit picked out. You I got am, the shamrock going. I am. Uh, I am not ready. Um, <laughs> I will be. I will be ready. I'm actually not going to be present personally in the hall. Oh, uh, Ooh, good move! Uh, on breaking, <laughs> breaking news. Um, but uh, we're going to do a uh, a video, which we will hope is funny. Where are you going to be? Uh, I'm going to be out of town. Doing what? That's all I got to say. Really? Yeah. He's been to the St. Patrick's Can I ask you the same before? question on this? And we'll get rid of it. That I've he asked knows. you in the past. If you had a choice, Governor, I want an honest answer between performing live at the St. Patrick's Day breakfast or being waterboarded. Which would you choose, Governor? Uh, I would probably choose performing live at the at the St. Patrick's. You would. Look, I'm not that funny. So, um, but it's it's a it is a fun thing. I mean, I know in Can the be. past people have uh, sometimes gone off the uh, gone off the deep. Been, uh, but um, most of the time it's funny, and uh, particularly the you know the the jokes we make of ourselves. Governor, uh, you spent a lot of your time of late advocating for your initiative, a couple of billion dollars in new taxes directed to things like early education, transportation. Where are we, and what's your assessment of where you are on this thing? Well, I have filed uh, the budget, as you know, which uh, which does call for new revenue for investing in transportation and in education, but but mainly it's about investing in jobs because it's a proven strategy that by building and maintaining a modern transportation system and that connectivity that a transportation system brings us and investing in targeted ways in things like early education, in college affordability, in workforce uh, training and, and development, we grow jobs. And um, we've done that uh, in more modest ways uh, through the uh, downturn. It's one of the reasons why we've come out of recession faster than most other states. And the question 
now is are we prepared to sacrifice a little to get us a whole lot um, in the in the present and in the uh, and in the future so the, my budget's before the house now it's their turn the speaker and his team are working their way uh, working their way through those issues and we've been working uh, together um, in a, I think a very constructive way um, they will come up with their version uh, in the next several weeks and it'll go over to the Senate and it's very very important I think that uh, as uh, uh, the folks inside Beacon Hill work this through that the folks outside uh, Beacon Hill engage as well on the specific uh, transportation plan the specific education plan the ways in which we have identified uh, what we understand to be the unmet needs and and the ways in which um, people may have um, you know differences about uh, what those unmet needs are before we take calls a couple of questions about just explain if you can what's the intersection between two things between this two billion dollar plan for those purposes one two this 13.7 billion dollar transportation bond bill over 10 years right. that I think you filed in the last 24 hours and the third part of that is if either or both of those things happen would that alleviate the need for a fare hike and a service cut at the T that they've been talking about or is that a separate thing totally no they're all they're all connected the uh, the remember last year when uh, the T had its uh, its budget deficit and there was a kind of a crisis mentality and and the legislature stepped in to to close that one-year gap, they said at the time, let's have a comprehensive transportation plan. Let's really look at what the unmet needs are, what it costs to pay the bills we have, what it costs to uh, fix up what we have, and then what are the handful of, uh, of uh, expansion projects that would have a strategic impact in terms, of, uh, in terms of job growth and opportunity. And that is what we spent a year doing. That plan was released early this year with a whole bunch of funding options to go, uh, to go with it. That's called the Way Forward. It's up on the uh, mass.gov website. The total cost of that over 10 years is about $13 billion. So to authorize those projects, not to fund them, but to authorize those projects, we have to do a bond bill. That's what we filed yesterday. The revenue is to pay for that $13 billion over the next, uh, um, over the next decade. And I have a proposal on how to do that, as you know, by cutting the sales tax and raising the income tax, which rebalances things and actually means that if you know, you make 62000 or less, your total taxes either stay the same or go down. Um, your taxes would go up after uh, 62000 according to your ability to, uh, uh, to pay. If that plan passes in that form or some other, then the T's... Um, uh, you know, current uh, service and uh, 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 cuts go away. For how long? They go away. Period. Um, the because uh, this is a sustainable. Uh, this puts us on a sustainable path. You know, indefinitely. Now, there will be and should be and would normally be in in most systems gradual, predictable, fair and toll increases, but not the you know long periods of nothing and then big hype because we haven't done it for a long time. You know, be a point or two every two or three years, something like that. One last question before we get to, to calls. Uh, Bob DeLeo, the speaker, I've never heard him say an unkind word about you, I should say, so this isn't one of your critics. However, he speaks to the Boston Chamber of Commerce, as you know, not so long ago. He says, if we were to pass a new revenue package, this is about a week ago, I believe it should be far more narrow in scope and of a significantly smaller size. I mean, once the speaker has spoken, the reality is this $2 billion deal, particularly the income tax hike, is not happening. Is that not a fair statement? Well, the speaker and others have assured me that nothing is off the table. And uh, the, the point is that the speaker uh, and others in the legislature and beyond totally get the value of these investments, both on the transportation, but particularly on the transportation side. I think we still have some work to do on the uh, on the education side. Um, and I think he has in mind, um, or he has been urged to consider a particular way to pay for them, which is through the, uh, the gas tax. But you can't get there with the gas tax, at least not the gas tax alone. You'd have to triple the gas tax, which would put us so out of whack and be a tremendous um, uh, burden on, on, uh, on people and drive up the cost of just about everything. 
So, um, I mean, there's a, you know, I proposed the gas tax in the past. Remember, we talked about that a few, yeah. a few years ago. And they did the sales tax instead. And they did the sales tax in, uh, instead. I'm not hostile to the gas tax, but this is why I didn't propose it uh, 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 this time. Does that mean if he did come up with a gas tax as an alternative to one of the, let's say, the income tax hike, at least a piece of that, you'd say, I'll consider that seriously? I've told him, just as he's told me, nothing's off the table, but I've told him I am not closed to anything. Okay. It may be at the end of the day, Jim, that that uh, the solution here is a blend of a bunch of different things. I totally get that. We'll get back to more budget issues in a second, but let's take some phone calls. And again, our number is 877-301-8970, and our email is BPR, as in Boston Public Radio, at WGBH.org. Governor, you want to take some calls? All right. Let's see. Uh, Marianne is calling from Freetown. Marianne. Hi, Marianne. Hi, I, uh, Free, Freetown. That's me, right? That's yeah, that's you. you. Okay, <laughs> that's me. I didn't. It, it kind of. I got a little static on that. Good afternoon. Um, I get uh, a little static afternoon. every day, Maria. <laughs> but I'm bummed. <laughs> Um, first of all, I want to thank you for your comment uh, earlier this week that taxes are the price we pay for civilization, because I absolutely agree with you on that. And you. Uh, it's time for people to be adults, as you said. Um, I will uh, tell you, Marianne, I've been admonished to stop saying um, that we need an adult conversation about, about taxes, because um, some members uh, on, the, on, on Beacon Hill feel that I, that I am referring to them as children, which is not my intention. So <laughs> I, what I mean I, is... I absolutely understand. What, what I mean is, we need a sober conversation uh, yeah. about uh, about taxes. Um, I'm calling about Scooter Ernestina. Yeah. Uh, first, I want to thank you for appointing Ed Lambert Commissioner of DCR. He understands how important the ship is. Yes. And he's been working very hard. And uh, my question for you is, if you will urge Commissioner Lambert and President Mulder Faria and Admiral Gernon to work together to get Ernestina sailing again and, and serving the Commonwealth as she has in the past. Uh, Marianne, do you want to just say for the callers what Ernestina, who may not know what Ernestina sure. is? Sure. Ernestina is the official vessel of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. She was built in Essex in 1894 and sailed out of Gloucester fishing. She did some science um, before World War II and served in World War II. Then she was a a, um, packet ship to the Cape Verde Islands, and uh, so she, and then she was given back uh, to the United States and, and to Massachusetts um, as a gift from the Cape Verdean people. And she's been serving the Commonwealth since uh, 1982 as an educational vessel. This is what we call a public radio audience. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Good for you. That's a great story, Mary. And well, she's our boat, and we need to take care of her and make sure that she can um, serve the Commonwealth as she has in the past because she tells the story of Massachusetts history, shipbuilding and fishing and science and she's uh, been more immigrant experience and she's, everything. She's and, been more down in, um, in New Bedford, I think, until, until re recently. Am I right? My yeah, she is still in New Bedford. She's still in she's New Bedford. In, so, uh, the legislation assigns that she be home ported in, in New Bedford. And uh, we've been working very hard to uh, with with um, Commissioner Lambert and with the Ernestina Commission to uh, get a plan to get her sailing again. Right. So the issue that Marianne is talking about is that uh, uh, the Ernestina needs some some repairs to be. Um, to be appropriate as a as a museum and as a let alone a seagoing uh, vessel vessel and there've been some interest in raising private funds to help with that and uh, commissioner Absolutely. commissioner Lambert has been and I will uh, encourage him to continue working with uh, President Molifaria and with uh, with Admiral Gernon down at uh, Mass Maritime to do so. Marianne, thank you so much for our phone uh, for your call. Our number is 877-301-8970 if you want to speak directly to Governor Deval Patrick. By the way, I just realized we are streaming live video of today's show at wgbhnews.org slash bpr so no facial expression okay. from your Marjorie. I just sit up Let's straight in my <laughs> chair. Good posture. Where is that chair? <laughs> I think it's right there. Governor. No, it's looking, not actually, but right, go right ahead. right at you. Governor, you, you read the Facebook uh, comment from uh, Maura uh, talking about how she's not inclined to pay more taxes right. while we're investigating so many departments and she's referring directly to the Chris Cassidy, Boston Herald reporters, great reporting this week, a couple of things. 
about Commissioner of Early Education Sherry K- Killens making two th- $200,000 a year. We find out she lives in New Haven. She's in this 300-hour-a-week internship to learn how to be a school superintendent. She's down in Ware from 7 to 3 p.m. in her own date book on several occasions learning to be a superintendent. And that's one thing. Then we found out a little bit earlier, and this was the Herald once again, my, my own newspaper, Daniel Curley, the former head of welfare, this forced is a, to resign. This is a... Uh this is a commercial. Well, I'm just, I'm just. Po- well, it, it, it was important reporting, and I'm yeah. pointing it out because people may not know this. Yeah, yeah. And that Daniel Curley was forced to resign uh, after uh, the, the Herald reported on EBT eligibility errors, costing about twenty five million dollars. Then the Fed said the state overpaid on on food stamps for twenty eight million dollars. So my long introduction there is to get to the point. How do we know there aren't more uh, six-figure state employees living in New Haven or working at second jobs? Is anybody investigating? Well, first of all, let me let me start with Commissioner uh, Killens, who was a fine uh, and strong uh, and able commissioner of early ed and did her job and did it well. And when the uh, when the um, and we knew, I knew that she was uh, interested in becoming a a superintendent um, and uh, was taking courses for her. The question is whether she was doing it on her own time or on uh, uh, the people's time. Right. And that investigation was done, and the conclusion was that she uh, she hadn't violated any rule. But she decided rather abruptly uh, to uh, uh, to resign. And um, uh, when someone in a leadership position like that decides to leave and leave abruptly, we do need a little transition. So we've asked her for two months. Uh, to give us that two months so we can have uh, a smoother transition. We have an acting commissioner in place who has been in the, on the uh, Secretary of Education's uh, staff, um, uh, but we need a little, a little of her time, uh, a little of her time. You know, obviously I would prefer that she were living in the, uh, in the Commonwealth of, of Massachusetts, but the question is, is she able to do the job and do it well? And I think she has, and I appreciate it for her, uh, um, for her service. I think it was right, by the way, to raise the question whether she was violating rules. Um, that's not my um, my issue, and I think we were right to um, to investigate that, and uh, and the facts um, are as I uh, as I report them. In the case of uh, Commissioner Curley, you know we've done a lot uh, around uh, uh, fraud and waste in the EBT program mm-hmm. and in and in welfare generally. We've co- recovered millions uh, of dollars. It's an imperfect um, program in terms of you know the the ability of the of the technology to do some of the things that people have wanted them, you know, to impose some of the limitations. I'm talking about the technology, not telling a tattoo store not to accept uh, EBT. I'm talking about the ability to use that thing in such a in such a place. We're working on uh, we're working on that. Um, but the overpayment on the um, um, food stamps, food stamps um, uh, was uh, and some of the some of the glitches. It was just the last straw. It was just a. Uh, it's just time, time for a change. So we've got a, we've got a good new uh, acting commissioner and a good plan, uh, and it is always, always about um, both the integrity of the program um, and the service and uh, and the confidence that the public has in it. Well, just one last thing on, yeah. on the commissioner, um, Killens, who's, who you said she did a fine, a good job. I don't get how you can be um, working from 7 in the morning till 3 o'clock in the afternoon down in where and really be earning your $200,000 salary. Well, you as do early. get, you get vacation days. I mean, yeah. I, what, what you so do. So is she doing it on vacation? Yeah. When you, when you, you know, you get, she wasn't doing that every day. Not every day, but no. quite a bit. Well, but you, like I said, you get vacation days okay. and you can make, uh, you can make those, uh, uh, make those judgments. Believe me, I have no interest in protecting that kind of behavior. Okay. It doesn't reflect well on the, uh, on the administration and it isn't about getting the job done. But people are doing things in their off time. You right. know, I wrote a book in my off time. That wasn't, and I, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not uh, shorting uh, the people of the Commonwealth on my $137,000 um, salary. Can I complete but the loop is, on that, though, just to be just clear? Just but, one, just I'm sorry. Within, the city of Boston does demand that most employees live in Boston. Should we demand that uh, that Massachusetts uh, department heads and big deal people that are making, you know, good salaries and very important should live in Massachusetts? I don't know. I don't. I mean, you know, I, I prefer it. Should we demand it? I don't know. It's uh, it'd be hard to imagine a lot of jobs where that aren't um, you know like mine, sort of twenty four seven job where you could live out of state and and actually uh, 
actually do it. But as I say, I think she did a really great job. One last uh, loop closer, and then we'll get back to the calls. Just so I'm clear, based on what you said, had your early education commissioner not decided on her own, according to you, to resign, you would not have asked for her resignation. Well, you know, I don't have to. I don't have to. Uh, I didn't have to cross that um, bridge because she got to where she got as quickly as uh, as she did. I think um, had we. Uh, had we gone there, it, I, it, it would have been helpful to have a more gradual transition, which is the reason for the um, for the two-month uh, consultancy. Back to the phones, Governor, please. Let's see. Dan is calling from Plymouth. Dan, you there? Hello. How are you? Hi, I'm well. Thanks for hanging on. Uh, hey, um, I've got a couple of uh, questions, but I'll start with one. We uh, had the Hurricane Nemo, and uh, my particular street was out of power for six days. Six? Uh, six oh. days. No, it gets better. Um, my house, I can literally see the NSTAR power plant from my house. I could have run an extension cord from it if they would have let me. Um, two what, women, was, the, was the power plant operating? Was it, uh, was it yeah, powered? Yeah, no, that, that, that's where all the trucks were leaving and coming out of. I mean, I literally went out there and was tempted to start throwing snowballs at them to uh, get them to come down, <laughs> literally run an extension oh, cord to, to my block. There were two elderly women who were hospitalized during that period on my block. I do and, know that. Uh, that was very upsetting. And I just want to know, I mean, yes, we all think the workers did a hard job and they were, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, man, I mean, is there any accountability at NSTAR? I don't feel that there was the same kind of problem with National Grid. I think it's NSTAR. And the other question is, um, I am also concerned about the nuclear power plant in Plymouth, particularly since there's a mothballed natural gas plant in Sandwich, which doesn't seem to be operating for mystical, mysterious reasons. Mm. And I just want to know, you know, why we, I mean, why are you confident that uh, a nuclear power plant, which was the same make and model of the Fukushima uh, nuclear power plant, um, why you feel that that should be extended and why, um, you know, what confidence do you have in that? i, I got to tell you, I'm not buying any more property in Plymouth as long as um, that power plant's there. And uh, thank you very much. Dan, thank you very much for your question. So, Dan, on the second question, um, uh, you 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 made it sound like I was advocating for the extension of the of the license. I wasn't, um, uh, but it's not my call. It's a federal call, as I think you as I think you know. And there were um, uh, federal safety conditions that had to be uh, had to be met. And the plant evidently uh, evidently or or is trying evidently to um, uh, to meet them. On NSTAR, the um, uh, you know, it's interesting that Dan was saying. I think has Dan hung up. Dan has hung up. Um, uh, I think. Uh, it's interesting what Dan was saying about um, the the relative behavior or performance of NSTAR versus National Grid this time. Remember, it has everything to do with where the where the brunt of the storm hits. And in this case, the brunt of the storm was greater in the Plymouth area, where where NSTAR has a larger um, has a larger presence. I think in every one of these storms we've had to do and will do in in the case of Nemo, the after incident analysis, and DPU has some power now. Thanks Thanks to the uh, to the legislature to uh, to hold uh, utilities accountable for their performance. So that uh, is yet to be uh, evaluated. I have said though um, that with the frequency of these storms, it really is time to for the utilities to um, to f to evaluate f afresh the wisdom of investing in putting more of our electrical power underground um, so that we're not dealing with this. I mean, we've had back-to-back -back storms and incidents of, of, of this kind Storm year after year after year. Five years. Exactly. And, uh, and, you know, we're going to need to reconsider, uh, and I hope that the utilities will reconsider their... Uh, uh, their uh, historical views on this. Governor, speaking of accountability, uh, at least the one article I saw, you didn't comment on a, uh, the effort by the Attorney General to get Northeast Utilities to disclose the last three months of compensation for the former head of NSTAR, Don May, who now runs uh, uh, Northeast Utilities. Finally, we learn it's in the neighborhood of $4 million. Did you support what the Attorney General was doing in terms of urging that Northeast Utilities disclose his final three months compensation? Sure. Um, by the way, I think it was more more than, more than was it more than three point eight for the last four months? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, just for that three. Yeah, months. yeah, yeah. Because yeah. that, I've asked you this before. He, in, in, somewhere in the range, putting aside what, whatever he got from the merger with Northeast Utilities, he was making a public utility head, where the rate a payer regulated, has a regulated monopoly. Under, a monopoly. That was my next point. Making somewhere in the neighborhood of ten million dollars, apart from this most recent disclosure. 
Is that a defensible salary for someone in that kind of setting? No well, matter how good a job someone might argue he's doing. Yeah, I um, look. I, I think I think people have. Um, Heartburn about that sort of uh, uh, that sort of thing. I don't know all the uh, considerations that go into uh, into the CEO's uh, compensation at, at that company or uh, or any other. I am glad of the fact that uh, we have a rate freeze agreed to from NSTAR that goes out to excuse me from Northeast Utilities that goes out I think to 2016, which was a part of the deal. And so being curious about the about the compensation uh, would would matter in terms of my job or more to the point the DPU's job if it was a factor in the rates being charged to uh, uh, to customers but those are frozen as I uh, as I say as a matter of optics um, NSTAR and North, Northeast Utilities and, and Tom May for that matter are going to have to answer for that our number is 877-301-8970 back to the phones Governor Patrick let's see uh, Tim is calling from Exeter Tim you still there yeah thank you for holding on good afternoon Governor good afternoon I'm calling from Exeter, New Hampshire. I, I live in New Hampshire. Like a lot of good New Hampshire residents, I was born in Massachusetts, Cambridge, Mass. Mm-hmm. And I work in Massachusetts a lot. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of clients in Newburyport, the whole North Shore, actually. And what's, I'm also, what's your business, Tim? I'm what? a painting contractor. Okay. And, uh, I do also high-end renovations, Mm -hmm. and I drive on Route 95 more often than Route 93, Mm -hmm. well, Route 3 when I go down to Massachusetts. Now, for years, the columnists in the Boston papers have basically generated income by making or generated readership by making fun of the people in New Hampshire. I mean, they made fun of the Hampton Tolls. They made fun of the fact that the Manchester Airport is called Logan Air, the Boston Airport, yada, yada, yada. I could go on and on and on. You know how uncomfortable Marjorie looks right now? <laughs> I don't think she's I squirming. She, she's squirming in her seat, Tim. But is there a question, Tim, if you don't mind, because a lot of people want to speak to the governor, please. So, Segwaying from New Hampshire being made fun of, when I am in Massachusetts and I want to travel through New Hampshire and I'm on Interstate Route 95, uh, there's this wonderful big giant rest area welcome to New Hampshire building on the northbound side. Yeah. And open 24 hours a day. It's really great. It's well kept. It's modern. It's clean. Yeah. Yeah. So my here's my question for you, Governor. On the other side of the highway, there is also a highway rest area and a sign that says, Welcome to Massachusetts. I know where this is going. And uh, I could have called <laughs> Ken Brown, who's a client of mine, uh, a year ago and complained about this, and it probably would have got to your ear a lot faster. But uh, <laughs> I feel like bothering Ken Brown. Uh, so I'm bothering you and asking you why we can't have that building, if not staffed, at least open yeah. 24 hours a day. It's unconscionable in my mind. Like I told you, I was born in Cambridge, Mass, 61 years ago. We're getting older as a population, and we need to use the... <laughs> <laughs> Beautifully put, Tim. How about it, Governor Patrick? So, Tim, can I just say I feel you? Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, all, 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 30 or 9 o'clock in the morning, didn't mean to talk over you, and sometimes <laughs> they don't even open on time. Uh, we have it, we Tim. It. Let's hear what the governor has to say, Tim, and thank you kindly for your call. Thank you for the for the call. But, it's a you know, it may sound like a small example, but there are a lot of these kinds of things that have been cut out in order to... Uh, um, be able to make um, uh, uh, more, you know, d- d- to hold the transportation system together. I mean, this is exactly, this is not the most dramatic uh, example. You know, it's not a bridge that's at risk of, uh, of falling down or the I-91 viaduct out in out in uh, uh, Springfield, which if not repaired means the shutdown of the whole commercial access north and south in, uh, in western Massachusetts. But there are lots and lots of things like this that are unmet uh, needs that are contemplated in the transportation plan we put forward. We're talking with Governor Deval Patrick. He's going to be with us until the top of the hour. You can call him at 877-301-897 or email at bpr at wgbh.org. Quick break, right back. A better job? A 
spouse, a raise, children? What is it that makes us happy? Human beings would never make progress if we just kind of were content with the status quo. But, but no, we always want more. I'm Kara Miller. Research into what makes us happy and why. This week on Innovation Hub, tonight at 9, here on 89.7 WGBH. This program is on WGBH thanks to you. An innuendo in Natick celebrating the Hunter Douglas Energy Smart Style Window Fashion Event featuring Hunter Douglas Duet Architella Energy Efficient Shades along with Silhouette and Luminette Shading Systems. Innuendo.com. And the Harvard Innovation Lab, where entrepreneurs from across Harvard, the Austin community, Boston, and beyond engage in teaching and learning in pursuit of taking their innovative ideas to the world. ilab.harvard.edu. listening to Boston Public Radio with the Governor of the Commonwealth. He will be with us once a month, like today, to answer your questions from noon to one. Hello again, Governor Patrick. Hello again, Jim and Marjorie. Uh, here's a question, uh, Governor, if I may. Uh, casinos, have you contemplated, we talked, obviously, a lot of the first half hour about the revenues you're looking for, tax revenues you're looking for, to fund your, your priorities and you relate them to jobs. Have you considered at all slowing down some of those expenditures and waiting for some of the casino revenues to come in. Is that part of your possible agenda? Well, actually, you know, you remember that the casino revenue is apportioned already. It's, uh, it's not Every like dollar is a... Is yeah, a yeah. Oh, it's I didn't all, know. It's okay, all divided up in the, in, the, in the bill. Um, some of it goes to different education issues. Some of it goes to local aid and, and, and so forth. It's all down to the half a percentage point. So that's a mood issue. So let me ask you a related question. I've asked Steve Crosby, the uh, head of the Gaming Commission, on a number of... Are you concerned about what some would consider a deliberate pace of the gaming commission someone considered too slow since this all started the governor of the new governor of new hampshire maggie hassan mm-hmm. uh replaced a casino opponent now she's a casino advocate mm-hmm. says she's fast tracking it we have voters in rhode island yes in november who voted to expand their gaming uh, the, the spread of gaming at some of their their uh, uh, locations twin rivers in particular are you worried we're going to get left behind no. when our neighbors why aren't you worried i don't about that? i don't think so first of all i think it is really important that the Gaming Commission do this right, not just fast. And it's a big step. It was a big, big step to pass the the legislation because there were so many views on various sides of the of the question. A lot of those got baked into the um, into the different dimensions of the of the legislation. But there's still some judgments that have to be that have to be made. One thing that I will say, um, uh, maybe break some news. We have reached a, an agreement in principle now with the uh, with the tribe um, for a new comp. Impact. So, and we've we've vetted it with the Bureau of, of Indian Affairs. That would be the so, Southeast Mass site. Exactly. For those who don't know. Exactly. And we may be able to. We, we need to brief the leadership just to make sure they're comfortable with where we've uh, where we've landed and work out what the legislative. A calendar would be for getting it uh, approved, but uh, we may be able to sign that in the next few days. So um, if that is approved by the legislature promptly and by the Bureau of Indian Affairs promptly, and they, the Bureau of Indian Affairs actually in Washington has a has a, a statutory time deadline by which they have, I think it's 30 days or 45 days, um, the tribe tells us that they could be in the ground um, you know, this year. So That's that what, could be the first one then, obviously. It could be the, it could be the first one. You know, we, you were talking before with, with the gentleman's calling about the storm, you know, the storm, storm, storm of the century that mm-hmm. comes every five years now mm-hmm. and, and the, the, the Nemo and so forth. We all watched like, with horror this development up on Plum Island. With oh, wasn't houses. it awful? Yeah. Yes, it was just awful. And you know, Jim has done a lot of stuff in his TV show, and he had your Department of, of Environmental uh, Protection Commissioner on the air saying basically that Plum Island... Well, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim. You interviewed him. Plum Island has kind of had it. He said the it's, long it's term, it's, it's done. He said it, basically what my understanding is in the short term, you've relaxed all regulations, said they can do whatever right. they want right. there. Later, they may have to take them down, departing. With, but I asked him twice, in the long term, is there a future for Plum Island? And his answer was quite directly, no. Do you share that view? Well, you know, I don't have the I don't have the science, but I do know what the evidence points to. I, th- I think I'm right about this, that um, the beachfront on Plum Island Seated a hundred feet in a hundred years yep. from nineteen from eighteen eighty four to I'm sorry eighteen ninety four to nineteen ninety four, and another another hundred uh, feet 
exactly. in the years since then. So, I mean, if that pace continues, um, we are in big, big trouble. Um, the the um, I think the relaxation of all the all the regs was during the storm itself, the immediate run up to the uh, to the storm. And there is a, you know, there's a. I know there there are homeowners on on uh, on Plum Island who have had some ideas that uh, uh, that either the um, the DEP or the Army Corps don't think will work or will risk greater damage to their neighbors' um, uh, houses, that sort of thing. But uh, it's a, it, those were horrifying pictures. And I just can't imagine the gut feeling that's going through the, those homeowners when they watch uh, their homes, you know, toppling oh, into the God. sea. Oh, God. Well, it, it, I think you were wise to build your summer house in the Berkshires and not in the middle of East Ham. I knew the governor would like that. I, I think Cape Cod's going to be gone soon, too. I'm hysterical about that. Our number is 877-301-8970. Governor, back to the calls. Uh, let's see. Dana is calling from Dennis. Dana, you there? Thank you, Governor. Um, I have a question about transportation again. Um, like the commuter or passenger rail service, I'm not sure what the distinction would be there, but from uh, Falmouth to South Station used to be a really valuable service. Mm-hmm. And I don't believe, and this is long before you were governor, of course, and I don't believe it was uh, discontinued for legitimate or honorable or truthful reasons. What do you think I, the reasons I, were? Well, I think the highway lobbies had a big... Uh, had a big say in it because, you know, there was more money to be made, you know, tendering to, I mean, cars, automobiles, and buses. And So this I goes back a car. while. This goes back a ways, yeah. I've yeah. got from a reliable friend who's a walking transportation encyclopedia, mm-hmm. uh, and he got me interested in the commuter rail, which I would like to see come back. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like, you know, in Europe, Europe has a wonderful system. And uh, it would just be great as far as, you know, snowstorms and, uh, you know, because buses, you know, and traffic, when traffic gets really tied up, I think it would be a first step in alleviating Cape traffic problems. Mm -hmm. Not a panacea, but a first, a major first step. And people could commute off Cape to jobs. You know, outside the cave. Closer in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so Dana, the um, the South Station to Hyannis route reopens this summer, and um, mm-hmm. it's uh, it's it's on a pilot basis this summer, so that we can test out the economics. Um, and the hope is to begin to run it. Um, uh, year round, if um, uh, if the economics uh, work. Now that's in the plan. Uh, mm-hmm. You should know in the in the uh, in the transportation plan. There are other now dormant routes that used to be vital, like South Coast Rail down to the um, uh, down to Fall River, New Bedford, which mm-hmm. are also in this uh, in this plan. None of them are possible without new revenue, and that's the hard thing. People yeah. love the elements of the of the plan. They see the 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 worth in uh, in these kinds of uh, uh, projects. But we all feel a little, um, a little uncomfortable when it comes to the taxes to, uh, uh, to pay for them. And that's the conversation that, as a Commonwealth, we're having right now. Dana, thank you kindly for the call. Eight seven seven three zero one eighty nine seventy. If you want to speak directly to Governor Patrick, Governor, a question was emailed at a BPR at WGBH dot org. You've been obviously a surrogate for the president both through the campaign and subsequently on things like Meet the Press. Uh, Justice Roberts in the uh, in hearing <laughs> on why are you laughing? Are you talking about the voting rights? Yes, thing? I am. Oh. Justice Roberts in the voting rights case, uh, uh, and you were head of the Civil Rights Division, obviously for the. Uh, uh, Attorney General, the U.S. Attorney's Office for a while there, uh, basically made disparaging remarks about discriminatory voting practices in Massachusetts. Bill Galvin, Secretary of State, was up in arms. What was your reaction to what uh, Justice Roberts had to say? Well, I th- uh, thank God for Bill Galvin um, because he called him right out. But you know, this is a funny thing about uh, a Chief Justice of the uh, of the Supreme Court. He doesn't even have to cite his sources um, when he's uh, when he's um, in the, in colloquy with the uh, with the lawyers arguing a case uh, in front. It was just a, to me, it felt like a cheap shot. 877-301-8970. Let's go back to the Coles, Governor. David is calling from Seekonk. David, you there? Hello, Governor. Hi, David. Thanks for hanging on. Thank you. Hey, uh, I like what you're doing with your uh, proposed budget for next year. But on the uh, revenue side, I think that makes a lot of sense to uh, um, you know, move in the direction of a more progressive income tax, uh, you know, to uh, income and away from sales tax. Uh, but my question kind of relates more to local schools. I'm a uh, member of the uh, school committee here in Seacock, mm-hmm. and. Um, your proposed budget um, gives us some um, 
uh, ability uh, and funding to bring back some programs and teachers that have been laid off um, since the financial crisis uh, over the past four or five years. Mm -hmm. um, so as we build our budget for the next fiscal year, um, I guess our question, my question, our question is... Is it going to pass? Point, you get it. And what, what can we do to make sure this happens? You can get back some of these you know, very important uh, you know, programs that have been eliminated and teaching jobs that have been eliminated. Well, David, first of all, thank you for your comment and for your service um, to the children of Seekonk. What you can do is call your uh, state rep and senator and uh, and express your support uh, for these proposals. Um, I think, I, I, you know, I don't meet many many people, many parents, many business people who don't think that these investments are the right investments for us to make. The, the you know, as I was saying earlier, the, the issue is the classic one. Are we prepared uh, to pay a little more to get a lot more? And, um, uh, and you know, Marjorie raises, I think, a, a question on, uh, did earlier in the program, on a lot of people's minds as well. Have we squeezed out as much as possible That's right. Squeeze. before we go to uh, uh, go to the public? And, uh, and those are all fair questions. You know, we are, we've come Got six thousand positions in in state government. State government is smaller now than when I when I took office, and I think smaller than it's been in a long, long time. We've closed some twenty two or twenty one billion dollars in accumulated deficits. Sixty percent of that with cuts in programs and services. Um, most of the rest of it in uh, with the help of stimulus money, actually, and only uh, a relatively small part of that with the uh, with the sales tax uh, increase. We've closed agencies that we've been talking about closing in the Commonwealth for decades, like the Turnpike Authority. Uh, we've uh, rebalanced the... the um Health care uh, benefits at both the, both the state and the local level level through um, um, I think it was called plan design. Uh, you remember we talked about that on the program yes, uh, a year ago. And the, don't forget the MBTA governor. Well, the twenty three years and out, and that's, the, right. um, that's over. The, you drive me crazy. There is a big proposal pending still in the in the legislature around retiree health benefits. It's very delicate because it's taking things away from people, but it's I think fair and it's a it's a series of recommendations that were come up with by a lot of hard work by a lot of different interests, including uh, including labor. That's expected to save $20 billion over the next three uh, three decades. We need the legislature to move on that. So the, the, that work is happening. But um, we're not going to be able to reform our way to a 21st century transportation or education system, and that's that's a reality, and, and we all need to talk about that. Speaking of transportation, Steve on our Facebook page wants to know, why does the state concentrate billions in infrastructure projects in Boston and not in central and western Massachusetts. So right? that's also got to end. You know, that, that the, the penul penultimate example, did you say it was Steve? Steve, yeah. The, the penultimate example of what Steve is getting at was the big D. Right, where, which was one mega project in downtown Boston that basically sucked all the investment away from uh, uh, transportation and other public in infrastructure everywhere else. One of the reasons why the tab for deferred maintenance is so big right now is because we've deferred it so long. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of that uh, um, deferred maintenance is outside of the greater Boston area. It's very, very important to me to the point where I would not support a transportation uh, plan that did not have regional equity in it because we have so much catch-up to do. And everywhere it, it is done, everywhere we invest these, uh, these dollars, um, jobs and prosperity come, and that's the key. 877-301-8970 is our number if you want to speak directly to 1 o'clock to the Governor of the Commonwealth. You know, Governor, there was a proposal, a little half-baked as it turned out, to bring the Olympics to Boston for 2024, and Tom Nino pointed out that it would cost, you know, I think 6 or $7 million unrefundable just to make a proposal. But other people were really keen on it. Of course, it would be the whole state, really, because yeah. you couldn't do it all in Boston. How do you feel about the Olympics? Well, you know, when I was when I was a, uh, a, a relatively young lawyer and pr in private practice, there were a group of us who got together on this, and this is twenty five years. Oh, ago. I didn't know that. Um, there was a uh, um, uh, a prominent business leader who was very involved in it. And we brought someone who had helped organize the proposal for, I want to say, Atlanta. Uh, to Boston, to uh, which was one of the winning proposals, Atlanta or LA, I can't remember which, to Boston to talk to some of us about what was involved and how to get organized and the different types of investments you'd show you'd be willing to do and where the. I mean, it's a, it's a very exciting thing, but there's a whole lot to it and it's uh, and it's expensive. Um, so, I think um, 
you know, I like it, um, but I'm focused on something else right now. Yeah. Let's go back to the calls. Governor Deval Patrick. Let's see. Jesse is calling from uh, Lynn. Jesse, you there? Yeah, this is uh, Jesse Jagger from uh, Lynn, Massachusetts. Hi. Hey, I'm a, uh, back in May of 2000, or last, of last year, Immigration Customs Enforcement uh, kind of forced Massachusetts to implement the Secure Communities Program mm. over your objections. And there's a bill that was filed in January by Senator Eldridge and Representative Kurt Shortino called the Massachusetts Trust Act. And I was just wondering what your position is on, you know, the Secure Communities Program as it stands right now and that piece of legislation uh, that will prevent the breaking up of Massachusetts immigrant families uh, because of ICE's detention policies. Jesse, forgive me for not being familiar with uh, with the senator's uh, specific bill, but it's my hope that um, Secure Communities is going to be overtaken by um, comprehensive immigration reform at the at the federal level, and there seems to be bipartisan interest in that um, right now. I think the president's um, 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 oh gosh, I've forgotten the name of the uh, of the executive decision he made around um, around deportations and and students in particular. Was also uh, was also helpful, and the uh, reiteration to um, uh, to ICE to focus on uh, on violent offenders and not breaking up um, families while we wait to sort out what comprehensive uh, immigration reform will look look like is right. I do hear a lot, as you may, Jesse, uh, uh, on the ground that uh, in individual cases there's still some um, some fundamental hardship. Uh, imposed on on people, and there's still a lot of people living in fear. And uh, I I do think we we got to get this right and get it right in a way that is consistent with our values. And the first person I heard speak to this thoughtfully um, uh, since I've been in, in public life, the first person uh, was George W. Bush. Really? In the White House, when in the very first governor's meeting I went to as uh, uh, as governor, he was asked a question about this. And remember, he was a governor of a border state. Uh, uh, he he understands these issues in some ways. Um, well, he understands these issues, and he was very, very thoughtful uh, about it, and also quite realistic about the politics then. I think the politics have improved since. Uh, yeah, Jesse, thank you very much for your call. Governor, when we last were together in December, we asked you about, I think I asked you, about whether or not you still had full confidence in your lieutenant governor. Since we saw each other, a couple things have happened. One, the campaign finance office has said he may have violated state law, as you know. Uh, the former crooked head of the Chelsea Housing Authority, not former crooked, but former Ed has pled guilty, and the state is looking at state grand jury is looking into fundraising uh, of on behalf of Murray by McLaughlin. And you've read the Globe reports where there were a hundred and some calls between them. Right. Uh, employees are suggesting McLaughlin actually emceed fundraising events for your lieutenant governor. Is your confidence shaken at all by this plea, these investigations, this grand jury? Do you still feel the same way you've always felt? Well, most of it isn't uh, isn't. Isn't breaking news, if you will. I mean, the, the, it was the remember the lieutenant governor who asked for the uh, for the investigation to be sure that he was on the right side of, of the rules and and his understanding of the uh, of the facts. But he's been a he's been an amazing partner um, in a in a job which would be hard for a lot of people to do um, because uh, remember normally the lieutenant um, uh, most lieutenant governors have their own political. Ambitions, and sometimes it's uh, it's a great thing for that lieutenant governor to uh, to show a little uh, daylight between uh, him or herself and the and the governor for their own you know reasons of for their own politics. This lieutenant governor has been a fantastic partner, uh, and uh, when we argue about differences on on uh, on policy or politics, um, that argument ends with a decision, um, and then that decision is our decision. And that's an incredible uh, kind of partnership uh, to have. So I am grateful to him. I think he's done a terrific um, job. I understand his decision not to run because I understand um, uh, how personal a decision uh, that is. And and he's got a fabulous um, young family. And, I, you know, so uh, I hope his day, I hope his day will come. But he had a fabulous young family in November when he said he was running for governor. And then two months later, that same fabulous family he decided was was, you know, it's interesting what you say and how it's uh, how it's been reported. What he said was he, like a lot of people, would like to be governor one day. And I hope he will be governor one day. 
Fair enough. Let's go back to the calls. He's Governor Deval Patrick. Rhoda is calling from Newton. Rhoda, are you there? Yes, uh, I'm here. Thank you. Hi, Rhoda. Good afternoon. I'm Davidson from Newton Center, Massachusetts. Hi. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I am the parent of a disabled adult child who is now in her 50s, mm -hmm. who is living successfully in the community with her parents' assistance financially as well as emotionally, mm -hmm. and been very successful with our personal centered planning for her. Good. We have found when we tried to communicate uh, with the governor's office that you have no disability advisor. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very significant omission on your part, and I hope that you... You mean within the governor's office as opposed to within the administration? Within the governor's office, mm -hmm. yes. Because basically, uh, there is a new program that is coming out of the executive office. I presume that you know one of your uh, um, programs have a person under the new Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. will be instituted soon, mm -hmm. which will pull my daughter out of her our own planning for her mm -hmm. and take her out of Medicare. I retired early in my life so that she could go on Medicare. Mm -hmm and take her out of Medicare and put her into Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And this is a program that would be very destructive for her. So I think it would be important for you to have a disability advisor. I think it's significant that we do have, uh, it is a minority. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a member of a minority group, you know how difficult it is to get noticed sometimes. Mm -hmm. And you certainly have gotten noticed. And I'm glad that you <laughs> I'm going to so take I, that in the. I'm going to take that in the spirit in which it was. <laughs> your paternal instincts and your lifelong experience, knowing how difficult it is to have people politically aware mm -hmm. that the disabled are last on the list. Mm. How about that, Governor? About having a disability advisor in your office? Well, I thank Rhoda for her uh, for her comment and uh, and for her advice. We we do try to use the whole of the administration rather than just the staff in the uh, in the office and the folks who uh, who answer. Um, um, I guess would be the term constituent calls in the office triage to others elsewhere in the uh, uh, in the administration. But the point is the point is well taken. I'm 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 really pleased we have uh, a uh, a record number of people with disabilities working in state government, including in my office. Um, because I'm I'm pleased with that on a whole bunch of levels, including the uh, the symbolic uh, the symbolic one because you know folks do have abilities, in fact, and they need to be uh, recognized for that. But Rhoda, I take your point. I I, I hear you. You know, Governor. In a couple of Thank minutes. Thank you, Rhoda. In a couple of minutes, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, United States Senator Rand Paul's 13-hour filibuster protesting uh, uh, Barack Obama's drone policies. The drones become very controversial. I wonder what you. I mean, this is not a Massachusetts issue. No one's uh, no drones in. Well, actually, there's a bill filed by Bob Headland with some Democratic oh, that's support. Right. That's right. About dro domestic use of drones within our borders. But go ahead. I'm sorry. But, I just wonder what you think. You asking about... if I have a drone fleet? <laughs> I, I do wonder what drone fleet. you think about. <laughs> you don't have a drone fleet. I wonder what you think about drones, about Obama's policy about drones. Well, I don't know. Um, I'm not gonna. You know, I'm, I'm still trying to stay in my lane and not be, not feel like I have to have an opinion on on everything. I'm, you know, it does. I first of all, I think the president's been clear about the use of drones against American citizens on American soil, I, and and. That is intolerable. Um, I wonder what um, I wonder what uh, the people who make war on behalf of the United States um, how they make that calculation as between using a drone or sending in a bunch of uh, infantry um, men and women and how you do that um, uh, trade off. And it seems to me that when you add in the ways in which other technologies, cyber um, attacks, and and what have you, or, uh, or you know, other or, or forms of uh, weapons of mass destruction, that the rules of warfare, to the extent there is, there are rules, are all up for grabs. And I don't pretend to be an expert in all that.
Well, there is a controversy that I think is right in the governor's wheelhouse. What's I don't that? know if you've weighed in on the uh, state rock song. No, he's issue. refused to. I've read in the paper. Governor. <laughs> hey, governor, it's your state. You're the chief executive. I mean, do you want to hear a couple of little beats of each one and decide? Have you got right them all? We actually do. We do. Let's hear it. Teed up. How did I know? Roadrunner and I Dream see my on. time is up. No, it's not. Here are the two uh, contestants. Take it away. Can we one, take it? Two, three, four. Governor gives it an eight, says he can dance to it. How about Dream On? You know that for a second? Stop and shop and, and, and 128. Here's Dream On. Well, while we're waiting for Steven Tyler to uh, uh, to sing, do you have a choice, Governor? This is actually a hot issue. I know it is. Hill. Very hot. I know so where hot. are you? You I can't pick Earth, Wind, and Fire. We know you're a big fan of theirs. Well, They're not I, locals. If we, if we can't pick Earth, Wind, and Fire, I don't know, really know what we're talking about. <laughs> I'm not going to make a choice, sorry. I, I noticed that... Uh, Governor's remaining neutral on this. this I, noticed that, issue, I noticed that Marjorie was only boogieing here on the first I am, option, not the second. I am roadrunner. Don't give it away. Right? Absolutely. Hey, Governor, can I ask you one last question? And you, Jim, your uh, view? What, what's my view? Yes. I'm a Philly boy, so this says the chubby checker is my guy. What can I say? <laughs> okay, Governor, before you go away, this is an obsession of mine And while well, you're here, and I know you're concerned about health. You, did you tell us once that you were a fat kid when you were growing up? At yes. Point? You did. Well, what, I mean, yeah. whatever. So was I. I mean, we've had this discussion. I'm a huge fan of Mayor Bloomberg's uh, decisions to wade in all these public health issues. Obviously, as you know, a Supreme Court uh, judge, in, uh, which is not the highest court, it's a trial court in, Massachusetts, in, New, in York, New York, struck down as arbitrary and capricious his ban on sodas of 16 ounces or more than 16 ounces. One, how do you feel about that? And two, how do you feel about government doing what Bloomberg is doing? Where he's looking at salt, a whole variety of issues where I think one can make the case that we haven't been able to police ourselves. Where are you on that well, role of government? I think there's a lot more that we can do um, in uh, in teaching and showing people uh, the value and importance of healthy choices that stop short of making those choices for them. Hear that, Jen? And I, I, I think it. that's that's a... I, I mean, I, look, I, we, we're struggling with this right now, by the way, with this new law around the... Um, uh, body weight index yep. um, in uh, in schools, and I'm not comfortable um, with that. And so we're looking at whether that we ought to rethink it. But um, the fact is, this isn't just about what's nice. This is about a health ep- epidemic, and it needs to be dealt with as a public health issue. Most public health issues are dealt with with a combination of um, uh, public education. And um, and steps that make it easier to make those uh, those healthy choices. So, in the case of schools, for example, you know, having healthier food in the, much in the in the uh, in the cafeteria and smaller portion sizes and uh, and so so forth. So, I, I think if there's a sort of a uh, a type of choice, it would be for me more in that category. Okay, Governor, before you go, first of all, two things. Governor said at the top of the hour, anybody who has either Facebooked in a question, tweeted in a question, emailed a question, or if you're on the line, stay on, and the governor's office will respond to uh, to all of you. And, Governor, obviously the major initiative, as we said, is this budget thing of yours. How do people get information, at least from your perspective? What's the website again? What's the deal with that? So on the website, mass.gov slash governor, um, there are a couple of tools. One is a map by uh, uh, House and Senate district that shows uh, uh, precisely what projects and what education funding would come to your city or town. So you can see what we're talking about. This isn't an abstract number. We've actually built it up um, by specific projects in specific places. That's the first. The second is there's a tool where you can put in your own income information and see what the impact on you would be of the tax plan. At that same site? At that same site. Um, And you can also play with it. So you can change different rates and so forth and and come up with with your own own way, your own suggestion for how to uh, raise this $1.9 billion for transportation and and, uh, and education investment. When you come back next month, will you bring that little black bear or brown bear in your jacket? <laughs> oh, like that you is cute, huh? That oh, my God. Cute. Just unbelievable. That Governor Patrick, cute. we really appreciate your time. We'll thank see you, you next month. On Congratulations Public on Radio. the new show. Thank, oh, thank, you. thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for being us. with us today, Governor Great Deval to Patrick. Okay, he has been, as you know, here with us today. He's going to be here with us again next month. Rand Paul, did he shame the Democratic Party with his anti-drone filibuster to position Barack Obama as a war hawk. Christopher Lydon brings us that conversation on Open Mic next on 89.7 WGBH, Boston Public Radio.